Dave sees Mike more often than the rest of us that Grafana is out in the shore portal. Grafana, the, the I'll Dave. Remember. What? I'll remember to tell you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Another, another acorn worm here. Thanks. Viewer online is wondering, can acorn worms swim? And according to a Google search, I found uh, only their larval stages can swim. There's some sort of Okay, what are the animals that eat sand? What do you call those? Grippy? Detritivores. Okay, there's some detritivore that has, like, its proboscis comes out and in, but it, like, burrows in the sand or something, and then it leaves traces in the sand because its proboscis, like, comes out. That's that's the spunculum. That's what I would, or, or potentially the spunculum. Okay. That's that circular feeding trace I've been kind of keeping that? an eye out for. Oh, I can't spell my own name. <laughs> Speculums? You can also look up e Eki urine. They, they look similar. Spoonworms. Spoonworms. Oh my god, don't look that up online. It looks gross. Do we ever get animals chasing the laser dots like cats? <laughs> Respect the creativity of the question. We do get curious animals, but none that have ever chased the lasers. I would imagine these feeding traces would persist a really long time down here. Do you think that's true? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you can. There's no sand ripples here. There's. Um, there looks like a pretty fine sediment. Um, I would definitely assume that these could per, per, um, persist years, if not decades. Yeah. Sorry, some seem to have like that kind of fluff built up in the middle. Yep. Um, some maybe look a little more fresh. I, I totally agree. I mean, this is like the type of stuff that you can see um, on land and it's like fossilized. So I feel like it could exist for a very long time in the fossil record. Chris, did they take any push cores? Uh, no push cores. When this move expires, or if you've got tether now, can we try a push core? Sure. Roger.
Sorry, I missed the uh, exchange on what push course we've done. None? Not. Yep, they're all open. All right. Oh, all the way in at Atlanta. Because we're seeing so much uh, bioturbation, is this uh, possibly because there's not much current down here? Or the current is getting blocked by some of our rocky outcroppings? Yeah, that's certainly my interpretation of the sediment here is that um, it looks like um, we, uh, yeah, that there's very little current here. It's a, a fine grain uh, sediment with, um, with little or no bed forms which is one of the reasons I was kind of hoping to try a push core here, was that I was hoping the, the muddier, finer grain sediment would hold in the push core. Um, but as we just saw, not so much. We've been having trouble this entire cruise with the grain size of the sediments just being too high and there not enough being enough cohesion to hold the suction in the, in the tube. Push cores are also very small. Coralie, were you saying earlier that you saw some uh, bioturbation in the fossil record? Yeah, so um, I feel like most, again, not a paleo person, but I feel like most of the bioturbation we see in the fossil record on land um, was previously marine marine sediment. Um, there's a couple different ways you can get fossils. So I think the way that people normally think about them is a fossil like a bone or something, but fossils also include traces of um, organisms or plant matter. Mm -hmm. So if it leaves a mark in the, in the sediment, then that also counts as a fossil of that organism. Um, yeah, go. I was just going to say, for those of you watching at home, do you need to switch to the quad or um, stream three to see what we're doing? Because we're doing the push core close to the push core holder, so it's less quicker to get it um, secured. So if you're just watching um, oh, that's smart. the normal yeah. Herc HD, all you see is the sediment. You need to change feeds to see where the action is. So a lot of times when they do um, we were talking about IODP a little bit earlier, or ODP, um, but how they do push core, or how they core samples 
is they actually have multiple cores that go down to different depths, but mm -hmm. then they all overlap because they all kind of have this problem where you get right kind of at the top and the bottom of the core, especially the bottom, um, some of it can fall out. So it starts to get really confusing. But if you have a bunch of cores and they all kind of overlap, then you you can you can figure out where all of those uh, places are where the core gets kind of messed up. Those cores are also huge, so. Yeah. Do you ever look at any of the cores for any of your research? I haven't, but I actually do look at the cores. Um, for, I've looked at them for some classes, <laughs> kind of for fun. <laughs> Open the box, sir. Oh, no. All right. There. <coughs> you care which box this goes in? Nope. Um, yeah. I think we can tell right, that part. Right. <laughs> I don't know, it looks like a coral to me. <laughs> I might have trouble tying it apart from a rock, it's true. <laughs> Especially the coconut. Okay, close yeah. it. But um, anyone can look up the cores from the IODP website. I think you literally just search like IODP cores. Um, and they have like a map um, and you can choose your location and look at some core. And they each come with a very extensive shipboard report. Um, and even some of them do some preliminary geochemistry on the cores, which is really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. What is the IODP? Is it International... Ocean Discovery Program. Oh, okay. The uh, one from the Droidus earlier? Mm -hmm. I think they're... I think it's ending, though. The program's ending, right? Yeah, Droidus yeah. is getting decommissioned, I believe. Or like though I, it's like an international program. So I think they're thinking about coming up with a new one. Um, yeah. So I don't know what the there's a, a Japanese drill ship that's larger that's part of the same program. So I know it is a multinational collaboration. Um, and I had heard something about oh, ice fish coming over to oh. say hi. Oh, hello. Wow, huge. Um, Kevin Conrad in the chat says um, that he sailed on Droidus and there's full-blown laboratories on it. It's also super long legs. Like, they go out for... Six months. Yeah, yeah something like that. Time. I don't think it's six... I don't think the scientists go out for six months, but it's certainly, like, a couple months. Excellent. That was... We got the five centimeters, top five centimeters on that one. Which is what we're looking for. Come on. There's another little shrimp in the view. Park cam. So neat. Uh, Jacob from Poland, thank you for your very sweet, kind words. And thanks okay. for joining us for seven years. And each IODP expedition is two months. Thanks, Kevin.
Good morning, everyone. Is that Lynette? Yes. That was me. Yes. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning. <laughs> Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Sound audio check. There we go. Yeah, that's what I wanted to see. Test one, two. Aziz, light. Nobody gets it. Daryl, can you have us down, please? Thank you. You start that sonar there. Ooh. A little orange flashing light. Hey. Okay. Right, Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the four to eight shift. We are exploring unknown guillot number, or unnamed guillot number 10. Uh, so we're about, we started at eight, we're now at 4 a.m. So we're about six hours into a 24 hour dive, or sorry, eight hours into a 24 hour dive on the southern flank. And we're reaching, or we reached a maximum depth of 2,400 meters and we're slowly ascending up. So same as every night, if we could just go around, say your name, say what you're doing, so my name is Katie Doyle. I am a science communication fellow. My name is Corley Rodriguez. I'm sitting in the science seat. Good morning, everyone. I'm Brian Kennedy. I'm a benthic ecologist with the Ocean Discovery League and Boston University, and I'm the watch lead. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Chris, and I am the data logger. I'm Lynette. I'm the navigator. Dan in the Herc chair. Hi, I'm Ren. I'm in the Atlanta chair. Hello, I'm Daryl. I'm in the video chair. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. So this is going to be our last dive. Possibly last SPL of this expedition, if we recover a little bit early. So I heard that they saw something really uh, yes, cool please. on the previous ex or previous watch. Did anybody hear what that was? The coconut? Was that what it was? I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Not sure. They so did pick up a coconut. But <laughs> that's yeah. uh, <laughs> Randy Rogen at Boston University is um, fascinated by what she calls deep sea botany. Um, and trying to understand the role of plants in the deep sea. While they can't grow down here, they certainly fall down here, just like a whale fall or something, uh, but much smaller. You get logs, you get plant, you even get leaf litter, stuff like that. You do find the deep sea, and uh, she's really interested in, in the energetic input um, of plants falling in the deep sea as being something that's completely neglected. And it is 100% completely neglected from the science point of view. Um, how big of an impact it is remains to be seen. Um, but she's definitely in favor of a new subdiscipline known as deep sea botany. 
So were there, I wonder if there are creatures eating on the coconut. I can almost guarantee it of some sort. If it's down, but down here at any length of time, I'm sure it has um, some level of um, colonization. There's a rock. <laughs> oh, we're seeing it shortly. Um, yeah, we're so we the dive plan today has us coming up this little ridge on this flat area, getting back into probably pretty steep terrain, getting up on top of the geo, going through a flat section on the top of the geo, and then getting back onto one of these secondary volcanism cones. Um, so we are in the flat area um, right now and should reacquire some steepness here, not too far into this watch. Um, and yeah, and then we'll probably hit another flat area and sedimented, probably not on our watch, but later in the day. So it's just kind of, we're gonna be going up steep, flat, steep, flat, kind of alternating throughout the rest of the dive. Question on line. Oh, go go ahead. Ahead. No, go for it. no, I was just gonna question online is when is our next expedition? So we will be getting back into port on July or sorry, June thirteenth. Um, the on signers come on on the fifteenth, and then I believe they depart the sixteenth, and then they'll start transiting. They leave the fifteenth. Fifteenth. Yeah, Thank you. And then they'll start transiting up to uh, British Columbia, where the next expedition will. With will be with ONC, Ocean Networks Canada. So, um, but we'll have an expedition in between a mapping leg. To the viewer online. I'm assuming it's a coconut. I have not seen it. So you might be right, but I'm pretty pretty sure it was a coconut if the other watch said it was. Yes, please. Resume jellyfish that's just above the lasers. Sure, go ahead, Dale. It's so small. It is tiny. All right, thank you. Do y'all remember that old school toy, like where you, it's like a little cup and you push it inside out and you set it on your desk and it pops and it flies up in the air? Yeah, my daughter loves them. Yeah, that's what that reminded me of. There's still a huge hit at like kids carnivals. Can jellyfish still sing you after they're dead? Yes. Yep. 
Yeah, so, like, how do you preserve these specimens? We just wear gloves and put them. Uh, so they will eventually not be able to sting you, but they can still sing for a while. The, the trigger um, to, uh, to release the harpoon and the nematocyst is basically mechanical. Anytime it touches anything, it doesn't recognize it fire so even if the whole organism's dead as long as there's you know the cell still got osmotic pressure and stuff like that and it, it can still fire but once the you know as it the, the de as decay starts in and uh, once it's an ethanol or formalin and things like that it starts to break down um, and it loses its its the pressure and the mechanical biomechanical stuff that it causes it to fire will eventually shut down but if you find a jellyfish on the beach, it's definitely still capable of stinging you. Can a jellyfish sting itself? <laughs> no. I mean, I guess it's possible, but it does not recognize its own tissue. There are a few um, things that it doesn't recognize to not sting itself. And like a like clownfish and things like that, there's other ways that some fish have learned to like live and in, hide inside the jellyfish without hitting its tentacles or have developed a mucus coating that prevents it from stinging the ship fish. Just like you see, you know, those classic Finding Nemo a lot got to rub against the anemone so the anemone recognizes you kind of thing. Speaking of an anemone, oh, you manifested that. I'm still impressed by the snailfish from last watch where we like, have you ever seen a snailfish? Can you see a snailfish? And then snailfish. <laughs> Falcor also saw a snailfish yesterday. Oh. Like just a couple hours after we, us, it looked like almost the same species. They're diving off the coast of Costa Rica, about 1,500 nautical miles northeast of here. How does Falcor choose their expeditions? Because they go everywhere, it seems. Um, Same with Okeanos. They cha they end up, they're planned very differently. Um, but for the next 10 years, Falcor is going to just work around the globe. And each year, they're picking about a quarter of an ocean as their zone and then just accepting proposals for that area. So 2024, they're going to be working from in the extreme eastern Pacific, down the coast of South, of the western coast of South America and Central America, from basically Costa Rica um, to Antarctica, and then 2025 they'll do the other side of South America, and then they're going to work their way around uh, predominantly the Southern Ocean for the next 10 years, um, just like that. And and scientists just write proposals uh, requesting ship time, and they have a review review process. Um, uh, on who they select for um, cruises. So I'm part of a, a large interdisciplinary team that's requesting time next year um, to go to the Salas y Gomez uh, seamount chain, between, which is basically between the uh, western coast of Chile out to Easter Island or Rapa Nui. Um, and we just submitted the proposal a few days before I came out here. So we're still months away from knowing whether we got it or not. This might be dumb, but what's the difference between like Falcor and Okeanos? Do they both have like the same kind of technology, the same mission? So the mission is very different. Um, Okeanos is like Nautilus. It's a dedicated exploration platform and it really goes to the blank places on the map and tries to do baseline characterization. Um, of those areas. Um, Falcor um, is more PI driven, so you write a proposal and then the ship time is awarded to an individual or a group of individuals with a specific research project. And they do exploration -y type stuff too, but they also do some serious um, <coughs> like hypothesis testing kind of more traditional science where you go out with a hypothesis and you have a very discrete sampling plan and you may spend an entire 30 days on one site deploying landers or taking chemical measurements or something like that. Um, they also do a lot of advancing technology stuff um, and so they go out with you know fleets of autonomous vehicles and deploy them and stuff like that as, as uh, technology testing. 
Um, so it's a broad range of, of things that both ships do. But the biggest difference is Okeanos, like Nautilus, is kind of a, a more community-driven exploration platform, um, whereas Falcor functions more on a traditional principal investigator model. But the technologies and equipment that are inherent into the ship are pretty comparable. You know, a really nice suite of sonars, uh, a really nice deep water um, ROV system with manipulators and cameras and CTVs and all that. Kind of the base infrastructure is pretty similar. Um, Okeanos doesn't deviate from that base infrastructure that much. Where, and Falcor, depending on the project, brings out a whole bunch of different platforms, um, wave gliders, Auto autonomous vehicles, autonomous aerial vehicles. Um. Interesting. And then there's uh, the Joydis, which is just getting retired, which is for geological sampling, right? Uh, you mean the Joydis Resolution? Yes. That's a drill ship. That's a wildly different vessel. Um, but that, that is a huge ship that can punch really, really deep holes in the crust um, and do its uh, part of the integrated ocean, integrated ocean drilling program. I think I got that out of order, but um, but that that vessel specializes, and it's basically a converted like oil drilling ship, um, and it can go out and drill kilometers into the seafloor to understand the um, geology and the microbiology that lives in the um, in the crust deep sea. Uh, thanks, Kevin. It's International Ocean Discovery Program (IODP). Thanks, Brian. Good morning, Germany. Thank you for tuning in. Can we check out the CPIM? And there it out. So this looks like some type of portotelum um, C pen. We've seen several of these on this expedition, collected once or twice. Uh, Alright, that's good enough for us, thanks. Is that a Holothorian? Looks like it, yeah. It's not moving, though. Yeah. It seems to be blowing in the wind. So since this is our last dive of the expedition, is there anything that y'all have not seen that y'all are just like really hoping to see that was on your expedition bucket list? Tumbo octopus. Oh, we saw that on the previous, um, sorry, I just happened to be at the right time, right place, and I got to see it, it was beautiful. Let me put some salt in that wound. Sorry, Corley. 
I also saw it, but it would be cool to see it again. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still surprised at the, the lack of cephalopods or, or diversity of sharks. A big six gill shark will be really, really nice. Yeah. Chris, anything for you that you haven't seen on your expedition bucket list? You mean other than like a sunken pirate ship? <laughs> um, other than the lost city of Atlantis, yeah. yes. I, I would really like to see some, some cephalopods as well. Squid or octopus or something. Actually, also, I would like to see more polychaetes. I think polychaetes are really cool worms. I they haven't seen very really many cool. of them. I respect the polychaete choice. Yeah. Daryl, what about you? Is there anything that you haven't seen that you would like to see? Oh, well, sure. That'd be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like there's a coral or something over here. Something. Looking sponge stocky to me. Dead sponge stock. So to our online viewers, we have not seen any anchors yet. Other than the ship's own anchor, which we have not used. There's a little spongy thing. Can we zoom on that, please? Sure. Two sponges. Colophagus stock sponge. Pushing them barrel, sitting on the rock under us. And this looks like a small, probably Atlantisella uh, on the rocks. All right, that's good enough for us. And I'm, then I think on the opposite side of this rock, there's a Chrysogorgia top of the screen. Quick uh, fly and zoom there, Tara.
I was just thinking I need to find a really good hands-on sponge experiment. Like not with a real sponge, but to teach uh, like students about. I have like one for almost every single phyla, but I don't have one for sponges. Question online, is this anywhere near where we found the whale fossil? My answer is gonna be no. That's an acorn worm. Whoa, that was incredible how you saw it that fast. Definitely seen more of those this expedition than any other time ever. So cool. I'm struggling with the perspective here. Are you tilted down with the camera more than usual? Or am I just having like early morning vertigo or something? No, it's tilted in the usual place. Yeah. Okay, so it's a me problem. I just feel like it looks super steep in Hercules cam and all the other sensors are telling me it's pretty, and the, and the sedimentation are telling me that it's pretty shallow so it's just a me problem. Can we zoom brachiopod right here please? Go ahead Daryl. So this is a brachiopod? I believe so. I think there has been some argument on whether it's actually a brachiopod or some type of bivalve but um, that's good for us. Thanks Dan. Okay. But yeah this is a shelled mollusk or very closely related creature to a mollusk. So if I remember correctly, a brachiopod was thought to be extinct and then we started seeing them again on the deep sea? Uh, I don't actually know, but that wouldn't surprise me. Look at there all the tracks very in the ancient, sand here. ancient line, and yeah, this area has been heavily bioturbated. Look at all those tracks. Maybe we're going to come up and just see this whole entire colony of polythorians and acorn worms. Oh, there's your polythorian. <laughs> Thank you. I thought I saw a sepunculin beating trace down below, but we weren't in a position to really take a good look at it. So I'm looking for another one which is something we haven't seen on this expedition much at all yet either. What is that and how does it look different than what we're seeing? It's, uh, it's, can we zoom coral? Um, sure, go ahead there. It's uh, gonna be kind of a circular shape with a central hole where the wormy thing throws its feeding appendage out and just kind of drags it around in the, f in the sediment in a circular fashion around its hole. Uh, gotcha. It's something that lives in a sediment. Hold on, yep. let me get closer. Cool. The odds are we won't actually see the worm. We'll just see um, the kind of characteristic um, feeding trace in the sediment. And what was this creature called again? A sepunculin. Oh. So this is a primnoid, probably uh, Clipperphora. 
with one brittle star associate. All right, thank you. All right. Go ahead. A little baby Califacus sponge there on the side. Take a look at this one, please. All right. Another little Chrysogorgia on the left, and then maybe another from Noid here that we're going to take a look at. Fly by him there, Joe. Definitely from Noah, it looks like it's got a little solitary hydroid living in it, potentially. All right, thank you. Okay. Nope. Yep. Absolutely. Have you heard of anything called a paleo... Can't come up. Dictyon? Yep. Yes. It's uh, one of those deep sea mysteries. What um, is it? Um, uh, great question. No one knows. <laughs> <laughs> it is a, a shape oh. pattern in the sea floor of these dots that... Um, Looks like a honeycomb. Yeah that is found way back in the um, fossil record and we still see it today. And despite several attempts with ROVs or submersibles Roger. to, um, to uh, dig around and suck sediment and whatever, we've never been able to find the, um, find the creature responsible for it. Um, but that we definitely, um, yeah, it's one of those. Continuing deep sea mystery is what causes that honeycomb grid pattern of holes in the seafloor. Have you ever seen one? Yeah, I've seen it once or twice in the Gulf of Mexico. What for it? Go Gulf. And that was an anthemastus we just took a quick look at. And here comes another um, primnoid, probably Cliptophora. Do a quick zoom there if you want. I'm assuming you don't want to sample this given the DP is drifting. Uh, we're all stopped here actually. Okay, well then let's grab a snip here if you're comfortable with the, where the ship is. Right here. We have a uh, sample jars open, or what's the deal? Stick it in a jar. Yep, we got all the sample jars open. Roger. This one is um, not bendy, though. So we definitely run the risk of getting this stuck somewhere in the tubing. Stick it in one of the uh, little boxes, then? Yeah, I think that would be my preference, yeah. I got the... Push in there, Joe. Boxes B and D are open on the starboard ones. B and D starboard, Roger.
Enough there. Yep, that's pretty good. And Be brittle. Yep. And can we get a, a tight zoom on it in the in the manipulator before we put it away, please? Right, that should be good. Thank you. Okay. So that's a cliptophora. Uh, which ones were open? Uh, we got the second one and the last one. Open a little more. Good. Sample one eight five. So one of the things we look at, we'll look at with these primnoids is whether their polyps are downward facing or not. Yes. And that was what we were looking at in the, the zoom in the manipulator arm was to see the orientation of the polyps along the branch. Okay. Brian, did you get to fire the laser yesterday? I did. That's so cool. Yeah. Was it on a rock or a coral? We were just playing, or we were just over sand at the moment. You know, it doesn't look like a whole lot in the immediate <laughs> return. Um, so trying to get a, it's gonna, that kind yeah, of data requires right a decent, a lot of reference data sets. Um, mm -hmm. And so you really have to shoot a lot of known entities to build a spectrum um, of what you're looking at. So the data itself quickly isn't, for at least the biology, isn't pretty useful. They've got some spectral recognition uh, software built in for the most common minerals you would see. But um, for me, thinking about how to use that technology for biology, there's no reference spectra available. Um, and you have to clean out a lot of like, in this case, the water signature and the rock signature and all those things. Um, so there's a, a lot of work to be done on understanding the, the signal processing on the back end of that type of technology before it would be useful for biology. Um, but it's a really, that class of kind of semi-remote sensing for species identification, um, something I'm really interested in, in playing with more in the long run. Good morning, Birmingham, Alabama. I will probably be up there in October to go see the motorcycle races. And to the viewer online, there are no shipwrecks near us that we are on schedule to explore. However, keep posted they might find something later this expedition season, but not on this expedition. Push in there, Dale.
different type of Chrysogorgia here. Uh, these long, thinner branched ones we've been seeing a lot of this expedition. Okay. Steve Oskovich and I are having a conversation in, in the chat right now about um, <coughs> the shifting taxonomy of octocorals and how it is with the explosion of genetics uh, and the cheapness of running genes and, and an influx in samples from publicly available data uh, cruises like Nautilus and Oceanus Explorer and, other, and many others, um, how quickly the taxonomy down here is being refined. I think it now um, the ship on it. Which is really making it difficult to stay up to date um, across the multiple taxa. past a little euplectelid on the wall. Looks like we got another one of these little small Chrysogorgias. We just got a very sweet note from Australia. So thank you, Australia, for tuning in, and thank you for your kindness. Hello, Wisconsin. Hello, Oregon. Glad to see that you're tuning in with us. And yes, it is for the Barber Motorsports um, motorcycle races. My dad goes every year, so Come I'm going to sure he's in a little bit of bad health, so I'm going to drive him up there. on that? Yep, go ahead, Doc. All right, all right, that's good, thanks. Brian, with the Raman spectrometer, are you hoping to get to the point where you can like Star Trek tricorder anything so you can just zoom it in at something, fire the laser and be like, this is an octocoral, this uh, is a something something sea urchin? Uh, I think that is my hope. I think we are, I think that is an ambitious hope and it'll take us a long, long time to get there. 
Um, but yeah, that's that's definitely, I guess, my end goal in the long run is to be able to throw. Brian, not necessarily. Are you no. Can you hear him, Chris? Maybe it's. Oh no wonder. Okay, yeah, um, you're good. Uh, but yeah, I mean that's my long-term hope is you can throw some form of device, not necessarily a Raman spectrometer, but some type of hyperspectral imaging system, um, or potentially something a fluorescence meter or both, onto um, an autonomous vehicle and just have it mow the lawn down here and be able to detect um, and identify to some ta level of taxonomy um, the different corals it sees based on multiple types of data input. So in the long run, it probably end up being some kind of classifier, AI type classifier that you feed in multiple things, like you have eDNA running, and so you know broadly what species are in the area, and that helps refine the spectra that are available. And so you feed it as much data as possible, uh, and then it spits out some percentage idea of what um, animals it's seeing. Um, but like I said, that's probably decades away. Um, but I can definitely see the technology is starting to get to that point where the, the basics are there to start working towards that goal. That would be a complete game changer. I mean, you think about, I'm, you know, I'm using the analogy of what we're doing in um, satellite remote sensing with some of the work that's been doing on phytoplankton actually uh, in the water column and the surface water is you've got um, a new ocean color sensor coming online. It's, it's already been launched and they're trialing it now uh, called the PACE mission. Uh, it's a joint project between the European Space Agency and NASA and it's taking um, so currently the best color, ocean color sensors we have right now are sensitive to like, I don't know, I think it's 8 or 12 wavelengths um, and this new sensor, I believe, is um, sensitive to well over a hundred different wavelengths. And so by using all the different wavelengths at different ratios, you can get a pretty good approximation of what kind of phytoplankton blooms you're looking at uh, from space. And I don't see any reason the same technology can't be deployed in ROV on a shorter, smaller spatial scale to uh, help us understand the identification of these much, much quicker in a, in a semi-autonomous way. So this is likely another primnoid. You want a polyp zoom there? Yes, Brian? please. Yeah, go ahead, Darrell. Yep, definitely a primnoid. Since Steve's here, I'm going to not venture a guess because he'll just tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> um, all right, that's good with this one. And if we can take a quick look at the Chrysogorgia to the right out of frame. So Steve believes that what we're looking at here is also a Cliptrophora, just like we sampled a minute ago, but likely a different species. So Cliptrophora being the genus. Zoom in on this guy for us. And this is um, definitely in the in the genus Chrysogorgia, which is in the family Chrysogorgia day. Right, that's that's good for an ID, thanks. Supposed to be going that way. Roger.
That ROV move to me was so amazing. It's like you just stepped off the edge of a cliff and then you were still able to turn around and see the cliff. So cool. And thank you, Birmingham, for your good suggestion. I might have to check that out. I'm amazed that for all the feeding trays out here, how few actual animals we're seeing in the sand. The DBL's wonky again. <laughs> the DBL's wonky again. Looks like there's a sea pen right there. Yeah. Um, right under him, I think. I like how all the bioturbation is like curvy instead of just in a straight line. I'm guessing these must be mainly caused by types of swimming holothurians that land, eat a little bit, and then swim away. Uh, can we take a quick look at the acorn worm that's coming up? Sure. Go ahead, Daryl. That's probably good. Thank you. Okay. It's about 20 centimeters in length. So hopefully we should be getting out of the sand patch soonish, according to the multi beam. I'm hoping. Looking at the multi beam, is this possible or possibly a paleo shoreline? This far down, not where we are right now. I wouldn't expect so. No, but when we get up to the lip. Um, it's possible.
A viewer said this is like the moon down here. Nothing gets disturbed. Well, I'm not sure I agree with that. Look at all the d disturbance. <laughs> like all of these little circles and things are, um, are signs of life. The moon is definitely dead. Down here is teeming with life, even if it's too small for us to really see with the uh, ROV's camera right now. Can we zoom shrimp? So I believe this is a heterocarpus yeah, shrimp. Ahead, They're really beautiful swimmers. These big swimmerettes. That's good, thank you. Hey, Daryl, would you just make a note for when you see Dave or if Mike that the Grafana shore side is out again in the science portal? And I, I'm sure no one's awake to work on it now, but um, if you'll just help me remember at the end of the watch to tell them to take a look at it. Uh, would you just help me remember or to tell Dave? And or It's really a Mike problem, but... Why are people so interested in studying otoliths? Studying what? Otoliths. Ooh, why are people? Yeah. That is pretty much what I did my entire master's on. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Chris, take it away. Yeah. What's first? What's that sample number? Uh, sample 186. All right, thanks. Um, so otoliths are essentially, well, humans have them too, but they're essentially ear bones. Ear bones. Right. They're okay. calcium carbonate deposits within a, like, underneath fish, fish's brain. There's three sets of them that they use to detect forward and backward motion, vertical motion, and lateral motion. And you can remove them. You have to kill the fish, unfortunately. But you can remove them and section them kind of like the rings. And it gives you rings kind of like on a tree. And typically, you can tell the age of the fish based on the rings in years. Some of the smaller species or the shorter lived species, um, the daily rings are distinct enough to read, and you can figure out how old the fish is in days. So one of the things I did for my masters was use that as an estimate of daily growth, the, major, the mm -hmm. increment width between each of the, the otolith rings was an estimate for daily growth. So, so you can track the fish's growth throughout its entire life, oh, wow. which is pretty cool. You can also figure out where, what area, a fish is um, living in by taking chemical IDs on it, looking for different isotopes, and um, I think they use chromium or barium and some other okay. things. But Open I didn't up do any of that stuff. Though. There's a lot of URI um, my roommates good. in it, but um, they do compound specific stable isotopes, mm. and I know that one of the postdocs in the lab was studying otoliths or something. That Kelton's lab? Yep. Yeah. Um, but the reason why I'm asking this question is because one of the reason we're interested in getting these push core samples is because there's supposedly otoliths in the sediment and so um, that's one of 
the scient or that some of the scientists ashore who are interested in that, but I guess I just didn't okay, fully you know realize why they were so important. Thank you. No problem. Chris, did you study a specific fish for your masters? Uh, yeah, I studied well, the damselfish, right? Uh, oh. Rasses. Rasses. Yeah, there was one species that was my main focus species, and then there were four that I did a comparative study on. Very cool. When I was working for Tech Sparks and Wildlife in the dead of winter, there was a lot of times not as much work for me. So we did otolith uh, readings. So Texas would send our otolith samples to Florida. Florida would send theirs to us. And then you would just sit there and read it. And then around 2 o'clock in the afternoon when the big, big head boats would come back in, um, I would get all the otoliths. So if it was something like a pelagic fish, like a a marlin or an amberjack or something. I had a big ice chest in the back of my vehicle and we'd put those in there because the otoliths were so teeny, te yeah, you know, yeah. so teeny tiny that we'd take them back to the lab and we'd have one expert who would fish them out. But then if there's something big, like a, a bay fish, like a redfish, sea trout flounder, then I could just break them open and get them myself. Yeah, there's different, like, um, surprisingly, some of the bigger fish, like marlins and things like that, have relatively small otoliths. So teeny tiny. You need, like, those special glasses that, you know, mm -hmm. so you can see them. Some oh. of the ones I did were larval otoliths. Ooh. So the first ones I started out doing were, yeah, like, fish that were 2 to 12 days old. I'm trying to get those otoliths out are literally the pinhead size. How did how were you able to get through those? Like, was it just microscopic tools? Um, it just a really fine tweezers, like our dissection yeah. forceps. Um, and then you don't section them when they're when they're still in their larval stage or uh -huh. pre-recruitment. You don't section them because they're translucent. Just, yeah. So you can you just set them in a resin and you can look at the rings on the whole otolith. So neat. That's really really cool. It's kind of my or. Uh, eye blurring work though. You gotta take yeah, breaks really every once in a while. You gotta take yeah. It always looks like you're um being silly because you gotta take a break after almost every here, other can one. Can we take a look at this um, area right here? Sure. So this is what I was talking about earlier where this is a worm feeding trace. So that center uh kind of spot is probably the burrow and those slide marks coming in and out of the burrow are uh, it's proboscis coming out and feeling around in the sediment for food. Is this the egg cart? It could be an echi urine or it could be a sapunculin. Okay. Um, and the odd, I don't, I've only seen the actual worm proboscis like once or twice ever. Um, but you can clearly see here how it's been worked over and kind of that tube hole right just to the left of the lasers right now is where the organism actually lives and it basically just flops out this feeding thing and then drags it back in to eat the sand and flops out a different direction and goes back and forth and they're extremely skittish and um, so as soon as like the pressure disturbance wave from the ROV um, hits it it sucks back in so I've never seen one out just flopping around I've always just seen it slipping back into its hole real quick um, but just another type of bioturbator in this area. And these are really important uh, beyond just what the surface detritivores like the acorn worms or the holothurians and the um, urchins because they actually dig burrows um, that are big enough to, inc to improve gas circulation or water circulation that brings dissolved gases into the sediment and help uh, bring oxygen into the uh, normally anoxic sediment. All right, thanks, Dan. We were able to see one of these with its proboscis out. I feel like, I don't know if Steve said on the chat, but I remember it on 135 and 137. I only remember because Megan Putz was so excited that we saw them. Or it. Oh, and you can eat these in a lot of cultures. Cool.
Someone online is saying that Herc saw one of these um, worms in action a year or two ago. Very neat. Another acorn worm here. <laughs> Spoon worms, the best sci fi movie ever. Set that up for the DSC again for me. Can you read that? Uh, pip nine. Uh, thank you. We're ready. Students from Friday Harbor are wondering if anybody has quantified the sedimentation rate down here. Uh, in this particular spot, I don't know. Um, I, there have been several projects, there have been many projects across the Pacific um, that look at that um, through the use of sediment traps. Um, but sediment traps are notoriously hard to work with. Um, so I'd have to go dig through the literature to see where the closest sediment trap deployments have been uh, to this area. But that definitely is, is a relatively common thing for um, biological oceanographers and deep sea uh, um, biologists to do is put sediment traps out to do that just that because you can get so much information on the quality of the food, the, uh, the type of marine snow coming down. Um, but sediment traps are very tricky to work with because you have to leave them out for so long. You have to come back and recover them. You have to mount them up in the water column so they don't, um, so you minimize the chances of getting benthic sediment resuspended in the trap. They you know, generally have some kind of variable mechanism to um, close and open on certain time periods that has to run for months on a time. Um, I've never worked with them personally, um, but it is data that's super valuable to understand. The ecosystems out here, um, it's just hard to collect. Here's another one of those prototelum uh, sea pens. We've seen a couple of. There's um, just out of frame left, there was something that I couldn't tell what it was. Is that an urchin? What is that? Can we take a quick zoom on that? Go ahead, Daryl. Yep. This is an urchin. All right, that's good. Oh, Thank you. Interesting. Ocean Network Canada, or Ocean Networks Canada, uh, deployed two sediment traps. And I was on there. Really, really interesting. Not what I was thinking they were going to look like at all. Yeah, Steve in the science chat is uh, remarking that sediment traps that USG, USGS deployed in the Anagata Passage, which is right next to Puerto Rico, um, are still out from 2014, and that no one has had the funding to go get them again. Get them, so they're just sitting there waiting for someone to come and collect them. That's interesting. Uh, thank you to the viewer that sent in uh, the part about the nautilus worm. So back in 2022, nautilus found a new species off of Oregon. That is a type of spoon worm that they call now the nautilus worm.
Oh, baby acorn worm. Hooray, a rock. <laughs> yeah. Can we zoom on that, please? I do. This is some kind of sea star that's partially buried. Orbital star, can't tell. All right, thank you. Please. So Friday Harbor students are wondering if the next generation of ocean exploration vehicles will be AUV or ROV? Both. Both have a role. I think, I think autonomy, the kind of work we do with manipulator arms and, and specific targeted sampling and stuff with ROVs, um, well, uh, we're a long, 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 long way away from autonomy being able to handle that. I do. Um, I do think we will see more and more a shift from, like, the survey work we're doing with Hercules right now. A lot of this can probably be shifted more towards autonomous vehicles. It's been um, around. But I, uh, I don't see been around, so you RVs don't going, away anytime, Other way. Um, going away anytime soon. We move west 20, or east 20, sorry. No, you can just move, go east. 
least 20 from where you are. Yes, please. Can you get around the other way? There it goes. Should have enough now to come around. Yep, yep, go clockwise. That's good. Okay, you can turn off your auto head in there. All right, I'm going to be off comms for a few minutes. Coralie's got the con back here. Roger. All right, hopefully Steve is still watching so you can help me identify everything. <laughs> Is that a Pernod there? I can't tell from this far away. Can we get a zoom? Yep, go ahead. We're going to have to wait for the ship, I think. That's totally fine. Give you a rough zoom. But yep. Yes, please. And put Argus right on top of us there. Okay, so it looks like in the front Okay, you're gonna go away. Steve, wide. hopefully you can help me with this. But it looks like in the front, it's probably a Chrysogorgia. And then in the back, I would assume, it's a Primnoid. I can't hear you back there, Carly. Can oh. I speak up a little? I, I was just saying, I think in the front, it looks like a Chrysogorgia. And then in the back, it looks like a Primnoid. But again, this is taking biology IDs from a geologist, so <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. Or take it with a grain of sediment. Nice. Can she even move that way? Can she even move that way in this? 
All right, there. There you do. All right, that's the best look I can get there. We're stretched out. That's fine. Way stretched out, tail to tail. Sure, you can do one more move east. I don't know if you got enough to come around. Pulling on me pretty hard. Can we get a zoom? I think this is just a star. But can sure. we get a zoom on that? Go ahead. Good night. Okay, it looks like C Sea Star. Um, we've seen them eating corals before, but this coral doesn't look like it has any polyps on it at all. See that Sea Star's been busy. Yeah. Even the chat says that's a clean kill. Very clean. I'm kind of curious how this giant star is attached to this seemingly very, it looks so flimsy. too much and can't climb down. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's good. Can continue. Oh, I'm going to get a close shot here. Wanna go ahead. Get the DSC too. I did. Yep. Nice. Okay, it can go away.
Maybe, I don't know. Looks like there's some sort of cusk eel in Atalanta view. We can do uh, northeast next, or back to your wherever, whatever trajectory, trajectory, I can't say that word, whatever bearing we were on before. Roger. How quickly does the ship move? Okay. It can come around now. Uh, no. There's a really thick Sea cucumber. Can we get a zoom on that? Sure, go ahead, Daryl. Let's push it halfway while I get closer. Uh, I feel like this sea cucumber is way darker than any sea cucumber we've seen before, but I don't know if my eyes are just playing tricks on me. It's very dark purple. I think the previous shift, or maybe the other, one of the other shifts has said that they've seen one that looked jet black like this. And then in the back, there is, oh, yeah. I'm guessing, some sort of sea pen or something. Anthropomastid, one of those mushroom corals? I don't know. Okay, yes. Uh, Steve said it's, it's a C pen. Cool. Oh, I can try and say this word. Cophobelanon. Oh my gosh. I <laughs> do not know how to pronounce that. And then there's something floating, kind of small, perhaps that something similar to that jelly we saw earlier in the dive, early in the watch. Another sea cucumber. This one's very pink.
Yeah, I'm not sure either. Uh, so for the viewer online, I think uh, the big red counter, that's going to be our clock. Yeah, so we mark everything in UTC time, so it's going to be in UTC time, which is uh, 15, 47, and 38 seconds. Chloe, do you think that this is still basaltic um, rock or carbonate? This is, uh, it's kind of hard to tell. Um, since it's kind of this ridge formation, it makes me think that it's something that's more resistant to weathering, so probably something like basalt. But um, the truth is that we really don't know until we get a sample and see it just because the ferromanganese crust and then the sediment on top of the crust um, hides what uh, a lot of the material underneath is actually made out of. Awesome, thank you. Yes, please. Lynette, what's this black line on the high pack? Oh, okay. Kind of to the right side of this uh, ridge feature in this little crevice, you can see Ooh, acorn worm. an acorn worm. Been seeing a lot of those this watch. A little bit of a bed form formation, meaning we have a little bit of current. Thank you, Mr. Davio, for your very kind words. That's a very sweet message.
another sea cucumber. Cool sea cucumber. Sea cucumber just floating by. Yeah. So ethereal looking. And then Wow, great view. Looks like the sea cucumber is about 10 centimeters wide. up some more. Okay. Can we get a zoom on this? Sure. Okay, I want to say it's a mushroom coral, but I don't know for sure. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> but honestly, a great view of it in the still cam. Yeah, the colors look really beautiful from the still cam. Yeah. Viewer online says it's strange how many things are see-through down in this deep. I guess it's a result of no light being down there. Yeah, I have no idea why everything is, or not everything, but so many things are so see-through. Oh. I think there's other things that are see-through in the photic zone as well. Like there's some... Besides like tenophores and jellyfish? No, I mean, I think that's probably... I don't know what shallow water sea cucumbers look like. It might just be the species um, are see-through. Uh, most of the shallow water sea cucumbers I've seen are not. Are not? No. Well, some of them are a little more transparent than others, but they all have some kind of pigment. Well, who knows? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I'm sure a biologist knows, but uh, <laughs> it's a geologist speaking. Who knows? Yes, please. Chris, have you gotten to do or process any of the sediment cores yet? Uh, yes. How do y'all process those? Well, we don't actually process them necessarily. We just preserve them. So they will get processed by um, the Universidad Nacional de something in Mexico. Uh -huh. I can't remember what the A stands for, but, but that's who's requested the core samples. So we take them and um, take the top five centimeters and preserve it in a jar with ethanol, and then they'll process it. Only at the top five centimeters? Yes. Cool. So you don't have to do the thing where you like slide the metal? Oh, you do, do you oh, have yeah. to? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Right. But we don't sort through it. Okay. So what is the thing with the sliding the metal? It's um, honestly a really hard way to deal with core samples, but um, you have to give the push cores back to the ROB team, so essentially you have to...